Uh, the title of today's webinar is In the Nick of Time, the National Interoperability Collaborative. We have a very esteemed uh, panel to speak to you today. And please remember to put any questions in the chat box. We'd like to entertain all of your questions. The session is be re being recorded. I'm going to give a brief overview of today's presenters. Mr. Dan Chavez is Executive Director of San Diego Health Connect and a Sheik member. He has 30 years of healthcare information technology experience and an extensive track record of cultivating startups, business development, and product marketing. We also have Marcy Locke, who is the Senior Director of Data Governance for the Santa Clara County Office of Education and the co-founder and co-director of the Silicon Valley Regional Data Trust. She has more than 25 years of experience in education data warehousing, guiding strategic institutional change and data quality management processes. We also have Daniel Stein, the president of the Stewards of Change Institute, which is a unique not-for-profit think tank. Mr. Stein is a thought leader, educator, and advocate in promoting and implementing interoperability by working nationally in the private and public sectors at the local, state, and federal levels. And finally, last but not least, uh, Margot Edmonds, PhD, Vice President of Evidence Generation and Translation. She leads the Acad Acad Academy Health Portfolio of Research, Translation, and Dissemination, Delivery System Reform, Health Information Infrastructure, and Population Management. At this time, I would like to turn this over to Mr. Dan Chavez. Thanks, Lucy. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, Sheik, uh, depending on where you're at. I think this is an interesting op uh, opportunity, uh, the initiation of NIC, or the National Interoperability Collaborative. Uh, I'm very excited about this opportunity. Um, San Diego is an ideal setting for this sort of collaboration. But San Diego, as you all know, is an extremely diverse community. Uh, with a lot of varying countervailing forces in terms of need, in terms of technical capability, in terms of information sharing and interoperability uh, prowess. And, and so something like this that organizes the entire community in an effort to share information is um, it's just so opportune. I think the HIE environment is just ideal. Uh, for, for this sort of collaboration, and uh, again, I'll just speak a little bit to what we're doing in San Diego, San Diego setting, but, but rather than do that for the sake of time, we just turn it over to uh, to Daniel Stein for an overview of the National Interoperability Collaborative. Great. Thanks so much, Dan. Um, this is, uh, I'm, I'm Daniel Stein, and we're partnered with Academy Health, and Margot Adams is going to just... Uh, open it up for us today, talk a little bit about the NIC, and then we're going to trade this back and forth a bit, all right? Margo, are you uh, ready to go on that one? Yep, I'm here. All right, take well, it away. Thanks, Daniel, and thanks, Dan, and thanks, everybody, um, for your patience as we get our webinar started. It's really a pleasure to be here today and to uh, sit around the virtual table and tell you a little bit about something that we're very excited about, the National um, Interoperability Collaborative. Um, Daniel and I are going to tag team this presentation. I'll start off um, to let you know that this, um, this initiative is funded by a grant from the Kresge Foundation. It has a lot of activities that you're going to be hearing about, one of which is an environmental scan of interoperability guidance and best practices out in the field. Um, we'll be doing some case studies, um, but it's really about information sharing and community building among all of the sectors that have something to do with health and well-being. Um, we've really focused on the interoperability space because that's the holy grail in our field, really. Um, you start with sharing information. You know, you start with identifying who needs to be in your community. Then you figure out how you can make the information flow. And we talk about 21st century technology because many of you know that we still have a lot of paper-based notebooks used for referral systems, particularly community-based organizations. So we think of ourselves as a community of networks. Um, that are going to bring, uh, bring broad benefits, uh, particularly for underserved populations. And health information exchange and the Sheik network is particularly important for us 
Um, my background is actually, I started off in healthcare delivery at an urban academic medical center, but migrated over to um, public health informatics. And so most of, many of my perspectives are from um, the, the, uh, the county level as well as the state level of trying to identify who needs to share information and how to get the information shared. So there are many layers of that that include governance, that include um, technical um, capacity, that include workforce issues and training, that include um, data structure, a lot of things that you're going to be hearing about. So we, uh, we feel that this is an idea whose time has come. And the next slide talks a little bit about how different uh, the, the NIC is from some of the other initiatives that are happening in the, in the healthcare space. Um, Daniel and his team at the Stewards of Change have really been working in the interoperability space on the social care side for a decade or two, depending on how you count. And uh, we know that there are a lot of other initiatives that are starting on the healthcare side. Public health has been doing this for a long time, but now healthcare with community benefit, and as you all are well aware, um, some of the provisions of the Affordable Care Act, um, talking more about population health, have really provided an impetus for people to share information and push out from healthcare. What's different about the NIC is that based on the stewards network, uh, network we're able to start on the social services side um, and be closer to the communities where the at-risk populations live. And what we're hoping to learn from our relationship with Sheik and the individual HIEs is how to capture best practices since you guys have been at this for quite a while. Um, so again, thank you for the opportunity um, to be here today. And I'm going to now hand off to Daniel to talk a little bit more about our two organizations. So Daniel, back to you. Thanks a lot, Margo. Yeah, without uh, uh, belaboring it, we've been involved with uh, information sharing um, we're literally about 15 years. I'll split the difference with you there, Margo. Um, <laughs> and uh, originally starting in child welfare and looking at the, uh, the difficulty of sharing information amongst various service providers who are trying to uh, support and help uh, families that have, uh, you know, are really vulnerable and at risk. And rapidly became clear many years ago that the systems were very disorganized and, and unable to share information. Uh, so we've been pursuing that uh, that that uh, that thread that journey for for quite a number of years, and as we've done that, we've expanded out our view to uh, include um, not only housing and behavioral health and mental health and food and nutrition, uh, but also healthcare and public health and public safety. So the the net gets broader because we all know that um, health is uh, is a is a composite of a whole variety of of social factors, health factors, genetic factors, environmental factors. And so we've been trying to both look at that and then bring those various communities together, which uh, can be somewhat of an unnatural act, uh, given everybody's overwhelmed with their own individual activities. But uh, we found over the years that by being able to really bring together uh, uh, complementary program areas and agencies, there's uh, there's more rapid advancement. There's there's better outcomes, and there's a, a better sense of satisfaction that we're serving a whole person or a whole family, and uh, that's really been at the, the core of of what we've been pursuing uh, within Stewards of Change um, over the last 15 years. And I, I don't want to go into more detail on that, but happy to share that or or share links with that. Uh, Margaret, you want to talk some about uh, Academy? Sure, happy to. Um, so this is our first partnership with Stewards of Change. It's been about two years in development. Um, we became aware of each other through our networks. Um, and Academy Health started presenting at the stewards meetings. And we started thinking that maybe we needed to spend some more time together. That it was really time to move some of these collaborations into a more organized um, format. And that was what led to the Krisky Foundation application, which um, stewards initiated and had a long-term relationship in, in um, developing that. Um, Academy Health is a national nonprofit organization. We have a very diverse membership of individuals and organizational affiliates, and we also have interest groups in a variety of areas um, having to do with health services and health systems research. We have a very robust portfolio and in information infrastructure building and have done a lot of work with the Office of the National Coordinator, several other agencies within HHS. Um, so we have government contracts. We also have a lot of foundation grants. And our, our mission is really to, to build evidence where there's no evidence to generate evidence 
to evaluate it and then translate it and move it into policy and practice. Um, so we're really delighted to be able to um, have begun this work um, with the Stewards of Change folks. And um, I th I'm going to turn it back over to Daniel to talk about some of our inaugural partners with the NIC. So next Thanks, slide. Mark. Thanks, Margo. Yeah, and I think it's important, uh, earlier in one of the earlier slides, we talked about a community of networks. And one of the things that we're very uh, focused on is each domain of activity, whether or not it's health or public safety or public health or human services, have their own networks. And our goal is to really try to link and connect and leverage those networks between and amongst themselves, really at a systems level, to uh, achieve better, you know, better goals and outcomes and efficiency and those things. So we started with um, three, actually four partners, so to speak, uh, who have uh, basically signed up, signed on to the grant, and said they want to participate in some to-be-determined way. Um, and you can see on there we have, uh, within the state of California, we have the Health and Human Services Agency itself, which, which operates uh, across 14 different, uh, 14 different domains uh, or programs. Uh, also on the, uh, we also have, and we're delighted to have Silicon Valley Regional Data Trust uh, as a as a partner within the state, given their uh, really exciting and innovative work, and you're going to hear from the executive director Marcy Locke in just a few minutes here. We're really excited about that because I think it really embodies uh, a lot of the work we're talking about here at the at the collaborative. The other uh, uh, state level organization is Connecticut Department of Social Services, which is the basically the Medicaid agency in in the state of Connecticut. It runs also a number of other programs, including cash supports and food nutrition and social work kinds of things. Um, and they have a particular interest in uh, improving interoperability in and across the state. The third partner is uh, also looks a lot like California in its structural makeup. It's Virginia, uh, state-administered, county-run. And in the social services, that's an important distinction because in those instances, counties have a lot of authority and responsibility for uh, uh, working together. And within Virginia, there's three counties that have uh, been very interested in, in uh, participating, Fairfax, Arlington, and the city of Alexandria. And what's important about that, and you'll hear in just a moment from Marcy, is that in Silicon Valley, there's also three counties that are looking at uh, improving inter and intra, well, intra and inter uh, county information sharing. So there's kind of a parallel process. And then the, uh, the last uh, partner uh, is HIMS, uh, interestingly has been expressing uh, a lot of interest in, uh, in being able to integrate uh, social uh, determinants and social care into the larger health IT framework. Uh, so we're excited about that partnership. We're in the process of, uh, of finishing up a paper around many of these same concepts uh, across multiple domains. So each of them uh, will be focusing, uh, in addition to the broader environmental scan around what's happening around interoperability across domains. We'll be focusing more effort in each of these three uh, and four uh, partners. And in a sense, we're building the collaborative out from there. Uh, they represent uh, just the three, the three states themselves represent over 50 million people. We feel like that's a good starting point to build uh, the connectivity, the relationships amongst them, and, uh, and then build that out to the, exact, the rest of the country. Um, what we want to do uh, briefly here is uh, our goals are to really uh, convene stakeholders, uh, uh, both digitally, uh, virtually, and in person, to, sh to share really um, what's working, and importantly, what's not working, what hasn't worked, and to be able to create an environment where stakeholders can really find and work with other organizations that are doing similar re related work so we can expedite the cycle time. Um, want to develop uh, measures, build evidence, um, really look broadly, not only within each domain, but across domains, which I think is a, a, a somewhat of a novel uh, and ambitious practice to do that. Uh, we'll be providing multi-sector case studies and technical assistance. One of the areas we're focusing on um, as a use case is really the opioid issue, uh, and we're trying to focus on the prevention side. We believe firmly that the opioid issue in not everywhere, but in many places, really represents a, 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 per, a very important use case for why interoperability and information sharing is, is relevant. Two other points quickly. One is uh, uh, this idea of creating a training curriculum and certification program. 
and we, we call it the interoptimability program. Uh, and we coined that word to think about the, the what do systems do after they've connected the boxes and wires? Right? How do they use the information? And then how do you train people to think laterally? How do you, think, how do you help people understand the, the factors that impact decision making that not only are within one domain but across domains? Um, and then finally, we want to disseminate that information and recommendations, both through an online portal, which we're beginning to work on, and then through a variety of other communities who are able to do that. Um, so, Margo, do you want to uh, do you want to talk about this? And then we'll. I'm sure. 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 Thanks, Daniel. I think just to sum up, I think we, you know one of the things we want to do is not reinvent the wheel. Um, we know that a lot of this work is going on already. Um, we got as far as we did already because of networks and, and communicating out. And so I think that um, one of the reasons that we wanted to build this community of network is because of networks is because so much work is happening right now. Um, and we and it's it's like you know the metaphors about changing the wheels while you're driving down the, the road. It's just incredibly challenging to keep up, but also very exciting. And I think those of us who have worked on the social care side, um, and are, are looking at what's happening with healthcare coverage in the country are concerned um, that we make sure that we um, improve efficiency and improve communications as fast as possible. Um, so we are, we are currently working on an environmental scan of interoperability guidance where, of course, HIEs have been in this space um, very, um, uh, very well established and have really good guidance and, you know, the fact that you're operating um, at the level at which you're operating and that you communicate is a great model for us, something that we, you know, in, as we set our aspirational goals, we want to be like you. Um, we also are um, going to be working um, with these projects uh, and the, the uh, founding partners that Daniel was just describing as they begin to implement their own efforts to do information sharing and start structuring their data. We're going to be um, looking at them to see what, what's working for them. As Daniel pointed out, you also want to find out what doesn't work. And we can save a lot of time um, for other sectors by um, harvesting that information. Academy Health has done this with a lot of communities across the country. And we hope that, that information will be, will be very helpful. So we uh, are building a portal. We will have an, an externally facing portal so that people are aware of what Nick is, is doing. And then we're hoping that some of you on the phone might be interested in this um, kind of work and could reach out to us afterwards and maybe become um, involved in our in our mailing list and maybe even join um, as the as the activities evolve. So this notion of um, do, getting farther faster by thinking laterally, as Daniel put it, and by collaboration, we know that not every community can do this. And so you guys have been doing it for a while. So um, let me hand it back over to Daniel to see what you'd like to add and then uh, talk a little bit more about the roles and benefits of NIC membership. So Daniel? Yeah, thanks, um, Margo. I, I think the one point uh, that I really want to emphasize is that we were really excited, you know, in conversations with Dan uh, around HIEs and how HIEs uh, bring to the table uh, a really relevant and important uh, set of information that many social services and human services providers don't have direct access to. And so there's a, it's, it seemed, as, especially as we go out to look at and start to communicate with other potential collaborators, that this is a, a real seminal sort of starting point because of the relevance to that. And, and I'm just going to say two more words uh, about um, our roles and benefits and then hand it over to Marcy because I think that the example of Silicon Valley is really uh, relevant to um, uh, to what we're talking about here. And if I could get this to advance, I'd be really happy. Um, um, oh, there we go. I'm going to go back one slide. Sorry about that. Technical year. So we, we've kind of defined participant roles and benefits. I don't, I don't want to spend much time on this except to say we believe this will be successful if we're, if we're successful in bringing in partners who bring different views to the table and are able to share their experiences and success stories and challenges and are interested and willing to learn and share online and in-person discussions. Um, it, it's that opportunity for years we've been looking for a, a, a place, an organization that is really aggregating, disseminating interoperability across multiple domains. And we haven't found it yet. So we believe, and I, and I think our foundation partners, in, including uh, Kresge Foundation and uh, also um, Chen Zuckerberg Initiative, also believe that the time is right to really build this kind of environment, this community, and help steer um, 
you know, help steer the, the nation really and uh, in towards better and more integrated domain sharing. So with that, uh, uh, let me turn it over um, to Marcy to uh, talk a little bit about Silicon Valley. And Marcy, I'll be your, uh, your driver here. So okay. um, I'll try to follow your direction. Uh, but okay. hand it over to Marcy. There you go. Thanks, Daniel. And good morning, everyone. Um, I'm just really pleased to be able to be part of the webinar and the work of the NIC. And as Daniel said, um, I am one of the founders and co-directors of the Regional Data Trust in Silicon Valley. Um, we just call ourselves the SVRDT most of the time. But I, I want to pro provide just a little bit of context and how we fit into this really important work. My good friend and colleague in the SCRDT, Rod Ogawa, who is a professor at UC Santa Cruz, would tell you that back in the early 1900s, education and government set up separate governance systems so that education could avoid being entangled in the political corruption that was pre prevalent at that time in places like Tammany Hall. But we have been living with that legacy of the separation of education from government for better or for worse since then. And as a result, it's rare that education is at the table for these critical interoperability discussions with health and human services organizations. The SVRDT is committed to changing the playing field so that together we can all better serve our communities. Um, Danny, do you want to uh, please advance? So um, I spent, my, my background's in K-12 education, and I spent t nearly 20 years in one of the large urban districts in California and built one of the first education data warehouses in the country in 2001. By the time I retired from the district in 2012, we had 16 years of data and more than 60 million student records that helped us to improve instructional decision making and to close achievement gaps between our Latino and white students. What we were missing from our data warehouse, though, was data about which of our students were receiving services from other agencies. It was the black box scenario. Without that information, we struggled to know which interventions were effective or how to better align our support systems with other providers. We knew from landmark educational research by James Coleman in the late 60s that 70% of the variance in student outcomes was attributable to non-school factors. So while we could work very hard to improve academic outcomes for our students, we could only really impact that remaining 30%. Other factors, most notably poverty, played an enormous role. When the opportunity arose in 2012 to respond to a call from the National Science Foundation to build community capacity for data-intensive research in education, I was able to team with researchers at UC Santa Cruz to submit a proposal to build a regional integrated data system that would bring together a cross-disciplinary team of researchers at the university and, I think, uh, really important and, and a, a novel approach was to include not only this cross-disciplinary team of researchers, but a cross-disciplinary team of practitioners in K-12 and health and human service agencies in the three counties of the Silicon Valley. Um, so we were awarded the grant and began our planning in 2013. Next slide, please. Yeah. Um, so um, increasing poverty and substantial, oh, Daniel, sorry, go back one. Thank you. Increasing poverty and substantial achievement gaps among the ethnic groups and the 400,000 K-12 students in the region provided the, the really compelling region, reasons for this collaboration. Uh, we all knew that a comprehensive regional data set would enable us to coordinate services and provide timely support in a way that would allow us to improve educational outcomes for every child. Next slide. So this is a graphic representation of the Regional Data Trust. Uh, we chose our name very purposefully to highlight our governance model which is founded on establishing trusted ethical, legal, and technical relationships among all of our stakeholders. You'll note that at the core of the diagram is the Santa Clara County Office of Education's data zone, and that's the education data warehouse, one of the really important nodes um, in the network of people involved um, in the trust. 
It's what makes our initiative unique among working models of integrated data systems elsewhere in the country. Having education data at the core means that we can conform and centralize highly federated school district data, no matter what source systems they use. And, and if any of you are familiar with education, you know that um, the, the, the primary operational application that, that districts use, their, their student information systems, um, are different from district to district, even if they use the same provider. They're, um, they often customize them to the point where it's very difficult to get a standardized and conformed set of data. Um, so having this ability to link across all many different school districts and many different student information systems um, makes it possible for us to have a very powerful research agenda it's based on uh, a, a data warehouse that includes, and in our case, in the regional trust, 66 school districts in the three-county region. Um, and having that data in a, in a centralized place and having it linked to the other agencies uh, means that we're, uh, we're, we're going to be able to develop a very powerful research agenda and as well as predictive measures to provide early intervention and personalized support for every child. Next slide, Daniel. So um, this is kind of a, this is the regional view of how the data is flowing into the data zone data warehouse. We believe that this will provide us with a much more holistic approach to solving issues that extend beyond the borders of a single district, agency, or county. It also affords a broader scope for engaging our researchers as we wrestle with finding new approaches and solutions to what have been persistent problems in, in education. The first integrated application uh, we're calling Foster Vision. So, so you see we have examples of district data coming into the Tri-County Warehouse, and we have other agency data being integrated into that, and we're, we pull that data out into Foster Vision, which is, uh, it's it's a cl very closed database. It only provides access to authorized users, and those are the juvenile probation officers, the case foster youth, and the authorized school district student personnel directors. Um, but it is the first kind of iteration of the cross-agency sharing between the Department of Family and Child Services, juvenile probation, and school districts to better s support our foster and or justice-involved youth. Next slide, please. So um, to that end, and with our partners in the three counties of the Silicon Valley, we've envisioned creating a scalable, secure information sharing environment that supports policy, research, and practice to improve outcomes for children and families. Next slide. Um, these are the four goals that are in front of us right now, um, and they are guiding all of the development work that we're doing um, it, to build that trust framework and the governance model that will result in the regional integrated data system. We recently received uh, robust funding from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative um, that will help us to continue to grow the impact of our work. Next slide. So where we are right now, um, we have almost a quarter of a million students in the data zone with 19 districts on board in Santa Clara County, six districts from the San Mateo County Office of Education, and Santa Cruz districts are gearing up to participate as well. So we're, we're really over the halfway mark of building that robust database of, of the student information that we have from all of the school districts. And that, that database is very robust. It's, um, we have 25 different domains we capture from school districts, and that the data is updated nightly. So if I am a student in one of our districts and I missed school, missed school yesterday, um, that's reflected in the metrics um, for districts tomorrow, today. So um, we're really making this a very high value proposition for our school districts. We're providing them with actionable information. Um, 
that they can tap into every to really make sure they have the data in hand to um, really change the instructional practices that, and the services that they deliver to students at their schools. We have flowing nightly now from juvenile probation and the Department of Family and Child Services Foster Youth Database. Um, I just presented uh, the other week to all of the section heads at juvenile probation and um, we, we have a great partnership with one of the uh, judges from the um, juvenile courts and he has kind of laid down the challenge to all the probation officers that he wants them to show up at their next court appointment with a report from Foster Vision that shows they have logged in, they understand you know, the, the educational environment um, and factors that, that are impacting this particular student um, that's in front of him that day and he'll have information from the social worker and how the three agencies are collaborating to support um, this student. Um, next slide, please, Daniel. So uh, we know that at the, the heart of our work is, uh, I always say there are two mountains we've got to be climbing. One is how do we get the data all in one location, and we have really been making um, great progress on all of that. But the second is what do you do with the data once you get it? And that really involves changing the culture and practice of data use. Um, and we know that through the strong partnerships we've been building with our probation, child welfare, mental and behavior health, and public health departments, combined with authorized you know, access to data in a secure information sharing environment about the kids that we share, that we can begin to make substantial inroads into changing the culture and practice of data use. We already have some efforts underway that, that show great promise. Foster Vision is one of them. Um, I think we're one of the first, if not the only, um, initiative that has that data flowing nightly uh, to provide timely information to the authorized users of Foster Vision. We've also um, just completed meetings with case manager working groups from all three counties and from four of the primary agencies in each county to understand what data would help them most effectively uh, provide the right kind of targeted support to their clients. Um, one of the things that I have found really exciting about those meetings is the um, just the level of agreement from agency to agency within a county and across the county lines that um, really has um, helped us understand the, and, and really help the agencies understand what data the other agencies have really has helped us understand overall how, um, how we can begin with some upfront data that will be beneficial to everybody. We have multiple tiered systems of support working in our schools um, that will have um, access to some of this really critical information from other agencies to the students that they support. And we've developed a full suite of early warning indicators um, in the data zone so that we can begin to get an early start on students that might fall off track. Um, the students in those multiple tiered systems of support at the top tiers are kids that are often engaged in support services from multiple agencies. And understanding how we engage and know who those early warning students are will allow us to, you know, just be upstream of later issues that, that we know can lead to students dropping out of school. Next slide, Daniel, please. Um, so I, I've just done some screen captures. We don't have time to do a demo of the work that's happening in the data zone or in Foster Vision. But we provide, uh, we dashboard back to the schools, uh, 90 different dashboards and uh, over 350 metrics that are really targeted to, especially to those early warning indicators. So if you see in all of these, uh, the three of the, of the four screens, we heat map where the risk factors are for students. And every district has set those risk factors, so we're able to either 
look at things on an aggregate level or a disaggregated level through a whole range of filter options that schools can choose. Or we can always drill to student lists that give those same um, indicators in that heat map that you see on the, on the bottom right. So it's a very powerful, very user-friendly, um, highly actionable set of metrics that um, support all kinds of interventions at a school district and in a particular school or in a particular teacher's class. The last screenshot is, is of what is a foster vision, just so you can see a little bit about uh, if I am a, a caseworker or um, a student services counselor at a school district or in a school or a um, juvenile probation officer, I log into Foster Vision and I see kind of the, the larger view in the top dashboards of how many children are involved in child welfare in the foster youth system, how many of students are on juvenile probation have active court cases. We see some demographics about them in terms of their ethnicity, their primary language, the immunization status for them. Uh, we have had situations where kids are receiving, or they're being immunized multiple times for the same things because the records haven't caught up with them. So we, we pull information both from the health registry and the immunization registry and also from our school districts because our children who are entering K-12 are required to, to have an immunization um, certification from their doctors. So we have a couple of different places where we capture that information. And then we look at youth counts by category, so we see how many unduplicated students do we have across both populations of kids, um, how many of them are engaged in foster programs or in probation, how many of those students are special ed or on 504s. And we particularly look at the duly involved youth. That's our, our smallest population in foster vision, um, but it's also the most at-risk group of kids. These are students who are both in foster care and on probation. Um, and it's been an a area of great focus for our community um, from the boards of supervisors and the, the city council folks um, down to um, all of the agencies. So I think that kind of wraps up my part of the presentation. Um, I'm happy to you know, answer any questions that people have about what we're doing. And I'll turn this back over to um, I don't know if it's Daniel, Lucy, not sure who's picking up next. I think it's, uh, uh, thank you, Marcy, that was, that was great. Um, I know there's a lot of information to share. Um, I hope, uh, hope uh, participants got a, got a sense of it. Um, we wanted to just preserve a little time now for any questions or some conversation around, around this, but more importantly, how it might apply to um, CHIC and HIEs. And I guess I would ask, I turn it over to Dan um, for your thoughts and comments at this point. Yes. So thanks, Daniel. Uh, wow. Uh, that was amazing, Marcy. I, I, I see the media opportunity for lessons learned and sharing. And, and Marcy, maybe you could speak to how you overcame FERPA challenges, growth consensus, as it related to information sharing in FERPA. So can we start there, please? Sure. Um, we have, um, we have a, a data sharing MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, with all of our school districts. So as we bring a district on board into the data zone, that MOU is, is set up to, um, you know, to support all of the FERPA guidelines. Um, and we do, we do a fair amount of just conversation about FERPA with our school districts before they come into the data zone. Uh, we have some really clear agreements for districts that uh, the district, when a district brings their data into the warehouse, um, it's still their data. We partition it so that nobody else can see their data but them uh, without their express permission. Um, when we want to do studies um, where we're requiring linked data, um, we have clauses in the data zone um, that address that in the MOU. 
We also um, have a clause about research activities uh, that will use um, linked but then de-identified data for our researchers to have access to. So um, if there's a study that's going to involve linked data sets, um, the districts have to give their permission to be part of that study. What, what we're finding, though, Dan, which is, is pretty interesting to me, is that the districts have very little capacity to provide file extracts for research purposes. Um, you know, they're, we're, we're, we're under-resourced. <laughs> and yep. they, uh, I just, we just had a meeting this last week with our San Mateo County partners, and they were, you know, every single one of them said, you can go to the data zone to get the information for, they're, they're doing a big initiative on early learning and, um, you know, with the RAND Corporation. So they're authorizing us to be able to pull the research files that are required for those studies. So they don't have to do it. So we can do that heavy lifting for them. And it lets them participate it, 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 without, you know, a great deal of um, effort on their parts. That's great. So would, did everybody find the exact same MOU, Marcy? And, and yes. Think there would be an uh, opportunity to share that MOU with the NIP community going forward? Uh, I, sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, and we, we, the same, we use the same MOU. Um, the, counties, the counties are a little different in how they approach it, um, and some of that's just the structure. San Mateo County has, uh, I think, 24, 25 districts. Um, they're a very, they're smaller. Santa Clara County has many more. We have 270,000 students. Um, San Mateo County has, you know, half of that. And um, so they're much, they're much more collaborative. They know one another. They do a lot of work together. Um, we're in the Santa Clara County. We're bigger. So there is, you know, there's just some of the fragmentation that comes with having a number of districts and a large student population. San Mateo County has written into their MOUs that their, that their county office has access to aggregated views of all their data. Um, Santa Clara County is, is, goes district by district for permission to do that. So there's, a, there's some you know, subtle differences in the MOUs, but um, I'm happy to share them. Thanks, Marcy. Hey, Daniel, Margo, uh, how do you see HIE's role in the next? Uh, how do you foresee that? happening, how HIEs participate in the net. Great, thanks. Margo, do you want to jump in on that first? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, thanks for the question. So we've been um, thinking in anticipation of this webinar, thinking about the audience that we were going to be speaking to and ways that we could get you engaged. And I think certainly one of the first um, ways that we could um, engage Chic as an organization is to participate in our environmental scan, make sure that we are aware of all the interoperability guidance that's out there that's been generated. And I think I mentioned earlier that we want to, when, when we do our case studies, we want to find out whether the guidance is helpful. Um, we are hoping that we're going to be able to have the capacity to look across all the guidance that's been developed and, and kind of harmonize it and think about where some of the gaps are, where voluntary standards are appropriate, where open source is appropriate, those kinds of things. And we, and we think that um, Sheik as an organization can help us, and Dan um, in particular, and Lucy also, and, and others can help direct us to the people who are um, most able to help identify those documents. We want, want to be as inclusive as possible. And then um, for individual HIEs, I think it's the same kind of thing where we would like to be able to interview you and find out some of the, some of the questions that Marcy was just feeling about how do you actually negotiate a standard agreement um, I know that my, I have a colleague who's an epidemiologist in the state of Minnesota, and I know that they have had to negotiate a separate information sharing agreement with the state for every one of their counties. That, that just doesn't make any sense. And so we know that you all have a lot of, of uh, practices, and, and, uh, and uh, I don't want to call them tricks, but you have a lot of tips for us um, as, we, as we follow in your footsteps and try to see you know, where we can model some of the collaboratives that you, you may not call them that, but where some of the collaborations have, um, have been really successful, where we can learn from your experience. Um, Daniel, did you want to add? Yeah, just one, uh, one point, which is, you know, as we look at multidisciplinary or social determinants 
and think about how do uh, organizations, jurisdictions, you know, bring information together or make it accessible to be able to uh, uh, to bring it in as appropriate. Um, obviously, health information is a huge part of it. I think, uh, and Marcy, you know, in terms of even schools, uh, like in, for instance, California, there's a requirement on how, how much it's fulfilled for every child in foster care to help, have a health and education passport, kind of a digital passport. And it's awfully difficult to get health information into that passport uh, that can travel with the kid or between families or after they, after they leave the system. So there's some very pragmatic applications around being able to share information, whether or not it's behavioral health information or, or just health information in general uh, around many of the populations and, and the kinds of programs that are looking at a, a comprehensive view. So two, two thoughts on that. One is helping us think that through and the challenges uh, that you've encountered is just exchanging information and what kinds of models, approaches, tools, techniques have been successful or where you know, your, your, your own surveillance has shown you to be, have, have success. And that's one of the roles of the collaborative is to understand from other, looking from other domains, what has worked in terms of information exchange and what are the hurdles uh, around that. Uh, and I think that that would be a real, uh, potentially a benefit because a lot of the social services agencies are in desperate and, and very interested in being able to um, uh, ingest and uh, receive health information. Um, and of course, more dramatic things like opioids, and overdoses and, you know, sure. trying to sure. understand from a preventive perspective, having access to that information would be, would be great as well. Daniel, I just, this is my, I just wanted to add um, that one of the things that we're very excited about um, is our partners, the Regional Data Trust partnership with the California Health and Human Services Agency. And they are in the process of building out a new um, Child Welfare Digital Services Bureau. So we have been in conversations with them over the last um, year, year and a half, about how we could exchange information that, would, that will be of core benefit to both them and to us. And the, the topic that comes up always is because we have the most current education information, um, that we can push that through from our system to their system to populate that health education passport, which at this point is dependent on manual entry by the caseworkers for each child uh, about education records. And their entries are latent, you know, they're, they're very rarely um, accurate, but we have up to minute, up to the minute um, records on how, um, where students are in terms of their attendance, their behavior, their course grades, their credits, the number of courses they've completed toward graduation, which is really critical in our foster and justice involved youth. So we're, we will be able to push that data to the new child welfare system for the state. At the same time, we're looking to receive the foster youth records from social services to support foster vision and, and really the um, the mobility, the, the capture, the, mo the movement and the mobility of our foster youth because they're all, they often may live in one county and move to another or they're, they're just moving because of issues around housing especially um, that are so prevalent in the Silicon Valley. Um, so we're looking at being able to capture a much better view of our foster youth from the child welfare um, agencies. Uh, database. So the, uh, we're pretty excited about that partnership and how we can support one another in this work to, to be linking across systems. Very helpful. Daniel, Margo, beyond the initial surveys, the Sheik survey and the individual HIE survey, how do you envision HIEs getting involved with NIC? <clears throat> well, I think there's a, there's a couple of ways. Uh, one is to uh, you know, as, as you said, you know, sort of sharing some of the best and what we like to call worst practices. Uh, you know, what have we, what have we, what have, what's working out there and exchanging information and then where are the pitfalls? Uh, and, and to be able to contribute to the portal and be able to contribute to it 
and to show a to show a collaboration or a partnership or coordination with um, you know starting with social services programs and public health and public safety, it's creating that ecosystem. And your voice in that ecosystem will be really, I think, really vital and and, and very valuable to sh to really demonstrate uh, these cross system kinds of of, of of sharing initiatives and learning initiatives at one level. I, I think there's another place that's also relevant. We're uh, and Marcy alluded to it. One of the things that we're working on is this broader enterprise data sharing agreement um, that would alleviate the need to create uh, individual data sharing agreements between you know, individual agencies within a department. It would be a, across the entire enterprise that there's an agreement that of sharing data and the governance structure around that. And then the individual MOUs would be written that comply and conform, conform to, the, to the legal requirements. But that is, that is, that's an area of interest that is significant in every jurisdiction we've worked. And we're working on that, that actual enterprise uh, data sharing agreement and MOU not only in California, but there's interest in Connecticut, there's interest in Virginia, there's interest in a number of other states as well sure. who want to sure. want to participate so we can build it once and use it multiple times, basically. Right. The, the, that, that would be very helpful. You only got a couple more minutes. Uh, are there any questions uh, from the audience? I've sort of dominated the questions, and I apologize. I don't see any in the chat box. Any questions? We're running up against the hour. Um, I do want to thank uh, Academy Health, Stewards of Change, the NIC, Marcy, for joining us this morning in this Sheik webinar. I know I've learned a lot. Uh, we're very much looking forward to working with NIC. Uh, Lucy, it looks like we've lost Lucy. I don't see that she's online. So I will take this opportunity again to thank you all for participating this morning. And uh, we look forward to hearing more about the National Interoperability Collaborative.